All right, chapter 25, we're going to discuss renal, genitourinary, and gynecological disorders. We want to apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on patient assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Well, concepts for this chapter, we want to understand the pathophysiology of acute and chronic renal failure, the steps for assessment and management of patients in renal failure, assessment and management of patients on dialysis, understand the basic concepts of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, understand the patho of a patient with urinary retention and assessment and management. Understand the pathophysiology and management of a UTI. We're also going to discuss complications associated with bladder catheterization, management of patients with renal calculi, management of patients with GU trauma, Assessment management of patients with epididymitis, orchitis, and Fournier's gangrene. The basic A and P of the fe uh, female reproductive system. And assessment history management of patients with suspected gynecological emergencies. We're going to describe the signs associated with common gynecological and female genitourinary uh, issues. Describe special considerations in patients with sexual assault and vaginal bleeding. And we're going to also learn how to effectively communicate assessment findings for patients with gynecological and GU renal complaints. Renal disorders are usually the result of negative outcomes of untreated or poorly treated diabetes and hypertension. The effect on life and the quality of life from the shutdown of kidneys is enormous. It's often treatable, but still not without some consequence. Disorders of urinary system in male and female reproductive systems can lead patients to seek emergency treatment, and that's where they may call you. If we see here, the kidneys are more of on the posterior, posterior part of the uh, abdominal cavity, with some of the top part protected by the ribs here. They're supplied by the uh, renal arteries and the renal veins and if you see the um, kidneys are connected by tubules to the uh, bladder which is then connected to the urethra which is used to excrete urine. When we talk about the urinary system the upper urinary tract includes the kidneys the lower urinary tract includes the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. urethra. These diseases of the kidney are treated by a specialist called a nephrologist, and the lower tract is treated by urologists. <coughs> The kidneys lie in the retroperitoneum at the costovertebral angles, just at the lower ribs. The microscopic functional unit of the kidneys are called the nephrons. They're surrounded by capillaries. The proximity of the capillaries to the nephrons allows substances to be filtered from the blood. If we see here, we see the anatomy of the kidney. You've got the blood supply coming in and going out. You've got the hilum, the renal pyramids, the medulla, the renal cortex, the papilla, the renal capsule, and then urine is excreted by the ureter. The functions of the kidneys are to filter blood, eliminate waste. They eliminate waste by creating urine, which is the fluid retained by the nephron and flows through the collecting tubules of the kidneys and ureters to the urinary bladder. Most of the water in many solutes are returned to the blood. Urine production is usually about 30 to 40 milliliters an hour. Urine contains waste and is collected in the renal pelvis, which drains by way of the ureters into the urinary bladder. Urine is stored in the bladder and eliminated through the urethra. 
The outer layer of the kidneys, the renal cortex, contains the glomerulus and the renal tubules. The renal tubules travel toward the inner layer of the kidney and they deposit urine in the collecting ducts. The interstitium is where the tissues occupy spaces around the tubules and the blood vessels. The rate at which the filtrate is formed is called the glomerular filtration rate. And it's usually about 120 milliliters per minute or 7 liters per hour. The, glomer the glomerulus filters waste products and excess fluid in the blood, begins the process of removing excess electrolytes, monitors pressure in the blood vessels, and readjusts the blood pressure. After urine leaves the kidney, it moves into the lower urinary system. Urine leaves the calces of the kidney, enters the ureters into the urinary bladder. The bladder is a reservoir, the hollow organ that holds urine. Feeling full of the bladder gives you the urge to urinate and then urine is released through the urethra. And you're in a lot of trouble if you don't release your urine. Ha ha ha. The anatomy of the male genital urinary system. Again, urine is held in the bladder and it is released by the urethra which travels through the, the penis. Then the testes are, is the male reproductive organs. They're held by the scrotal stack. You have the epididymis, the vice deferens. And then exclusive to men is the prostate gland. The male reproductive system, the organs, reproductive organs are called genitals or genitalia. They're external or internal. Urethra is shared by urinary and reproductive systems, outlet for both urine and semen. The prostate gland is located on the inferior aspect of the bladder. The epididymis is located on the posterior of the testicle. And that's where sperm matures and it's where it's stored. The vice deferens is the tube that carries testicular secretions from the epididymis to the prostate. External male genitalia is the penis and the testicles and they lie within the scrotum. Sperm is produced in the testicle and prior to ejaculation sperm enters the vice deferens and the prostate. Combination of prostatic secretions and sperm constitutes semen. Semen continues along the urethra, leads through the urethral meatus. The penis is a highly vascular tissue that allows for erection. The penis consists of three columns of highly vascular tissue. The erection occurs when the parasympathetic nervous system causes vasodilation of the penile arterial supply, allowing more blood into the three columns than what leaves them. The foreskin is the skin and the mucous membrane that covers the head of the penis in uncircumcised males. Circumcised have the foreskin surgically removed. The female external genitalia is what you see here. You've got the labia minora, the labia majora, the vaginal entrance, the vestibules, you have the urethral opening where urine is excreted, you have the clitoris which allows for sexual stimulation. You've got the prepuce, the mons pubis, where the pubic bone is. It's really important to understand the male and female internal genitalia, and especially the female, because there's so many complications that could, could come up with that. The medical specialty that takes care of females' reproductive system is gynecology. You've got the vagina, which is a hollow tube that connects the external genitalia with the internal genitalia. The area of the tissue between the vaginal opening and the anus is the per uh, perineum. The 
uterus is a small muscular organ lined with endometrium that develops in a cyclical fashion in preparation for the possibility that a fertilized egg, also called an ovum, will be implanted. When pregnancy does not occur, the endometrium is shed each month during menses. This is the menstrual period. You have the fallopian tubes. You have the ovaries where the eggs are stored. The fallopian tube is where they travel. You have the cervix of the uterus, which is the covering of the uterus. Then you have the, the urinary function, where you have the urethra, the urinary bladder, and then that would be connected to the kidneys. The cervix is a passageway for sperm to enter the uterus and travel to the fallopian tubes. The two fallopian tubes, also called the oviducts, are at the uterus and they're connected to the uterus in the area surrounding the left and right ovaries. They are the passageway for the ova to travel toward the uterus. If sperm is present, fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube. Fertilized ovum implanted in the endometrium. The fertilized ovum is implanted in the endometrium of the uterus. The uterus curves around the posterior and superior portions of the female bladder and lies behind the pubis. The ovaries produce hormones and each month during the reproductive years a mature ovum and if the mature ovum isn't fertilized then it is then released through menses. The menstrual cycle consists of several days. Day one is when the bleeding begins. Bleeding lasts about five days with a total blood loss about 30, of about 30 milliliters. Ovulation occurs on about day 14 of the 28-day menstrual cycle. 14 days after the first day of the menstrual cycle, the mature follicle ruptures, discharging the ovum into the pelvic cavity near the entrance of the fallopian tube. Bleeding begins as the endometrium is shed from the uterus in non-pregnant women. The bleeding lasts about 5 days but ranges from 3 to 7 days. Of special considerations, menstruation usually begins at about age 12. This is called the menarche and ends at about age 51, which is called the menopause. If sperm in the fallopian tube during ovulation, fertilization may occur, resulting in pregnancy. If pregnancy occurs, fer the fertilized egg travels to the uterus and is implanted in the endometrium. As advanced EMTs, you may transport or monitor critically ill and injured patients whose fluid intake and output must be monitored to assess kidney function. This is called eyes and O's. This is accomplished by carefully keeping track of the amount of IV fluids administered and the amount of urine produced. is very important. During your scene size up of management of urinary system disorders, look for clues of the patient's problem, determine your chief complaint, your initial oppression. Your clues will be dialysis access sites, which are usually on the upper left or right arm. It's where you'll see a fistula, and they'll know about it, and they'll tell you they have it. The presence of a Foley catheter, a urine catheter, a fishy or ammonia odor indicating renal failure. 
decreased urine output, maybe a complaint, hematuria, which is blood in your urine, weakness, dyspnea, flank pain, changes in urination from what's normal, or even altered mental status. Why do you think a patient may have altered mental status in urinary system disorders? Well, the answer is because they're not filtering right, so those toxins are building up and they're circulating in the blood. Signs and symptoms of renal failure. Your body system that would be affected with your fluids and electrolytes. Signs and symptoms of fluid and electrolyte um, issues. Hypertension, hypotension, peripheral edema, ascites, crackles in the lungs. For CV and hematologic, they may be anemic. They may have impaired blood clotting or bruising. Neuromusculoskeletal, headaches, altered mental status, weakness, muscle cramps and twitching, osteoporosis. GI, they may have a loss of appetite, nausea, GI bleeding for their skin. They may have puritis, scratches, a uremic frost, jaundice, pallor, rash, an odor of ammonia. An immune system, immunosuppression, infection, and renal is going to be decreased urine output. And again, all these signs and symptoms, a lot of times, are going to be directly related to um, the fact that they're not filtering out the waste and they're having an overabundance or a, an inefficient supply of electrolytes. As always, you want to ensure open airway and adequate ventilation. Before you can move on to your next steps, that patient must be breathing. Want to provide oxygen if it's indicated. Assess the adequacy of circulation. Your ABCs. Hypertension is usually the leading cause of renal disease. And hypotension is usually a complication of renal failure and dialysis. Again, you're wanting to look for clues of electrolyte abnormalities, um, especially days of dialysis or patients that have had days of missed dialysis. Um, this may result in dysrhythmias and reduced cardiac output. And again, it's because electrolytes are not getting filtered out of the system. And not only that, but the filtrate isn't being um, released through the urine and that fluid has to go somewhere so it goes to the extracellular space. You're going to be looking for uh, pulmonary edema as well as peripheral edema, um, especially in patients on um, missed dialysis treatment days, um, simply for the fact that, again, the fluid is going to end up in the um, interstitial space. You'll start seeing third spacing, and it's going to back up into the lungs as well. Bleeding may also be a problem with hemodialysis patients. And why is that? It's because of the access site. The dialysis access site, which we'll talk about in the in more depth in this chapter, is a graph that's got the venous system and the arterial system integrated, and it is a surgical procedure. But if after that access site has been accessed and not enough pressure is held on on the um, graft, then arterial bleeding may occur and a shunt or a graft may bleed out very very quickly. You want to be sure you get your baseline vital signs. Vital signs in a patient who has a shunt which is the dialysis access, you do not want to take a blood pressure in that extremity. Again, you do not want to take a blood pressure in the extremity of the hemodialysis access arm. If a patient is unresponsive, just like with any other unresponsive patient, you want to obtain a history from family, 
family members, health care providers if they're at the dialysis clinic, or bystanders. And then you want to do your rapid secondary assessment where you're reassessing. If a patient is alert, you want to you want to get the focus history and exam. You want to look for signs of dehydration or fluid overload. They may have signs of dehydration because they've had too much pulled off um, in dialysis, too much fluid pulled off, or they may be in fluid overload because they've had missed days of dialysis or they haven't pulled enough off in dialysis. Again, you've got to remember that dialysis is a, is a good thing to help filter the blood in patients in renal failure, but nothing does as good of a job as the real thing, which would be the kidneys. Also, cardiac monitoring and electrocardiogram are essential because of the um, possibility of electrolyte abnormalities, and we know that patients with electrolyte abnormalities are often going to experience cardiac dysrhythmias. Also check for a history of diabetes. You want to get a blood glucose level in patients with altered mental status and in diabetic patients. And again, most of the time a patient is in, has gotten to the part of end-stage renal failure because of uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension. You want to note the skin temperature Fever may occur with a UTI, but absence does not rule out UTI, and this is especially important in patients with bladder catheters. There are patients that would not be able to excrete urine without a bladder catheter. You want to ask questions about changes in urination, color, difficulty, inability, pain, or more frequent urination, blood in urine, dark colored urine, cloudy or colorless urine. Again, all these, these descriptions of urine can give you a clue as to what's going on. If they've got real cloudy urine, that might indicate a urinary tract infection. Dark colored urine may, may indicate bleeding. Colorless urine may indicate that they're fluid overloaded. Past medical history problems. And then also check the medications the patient is taking, which most of these patients will be taking a good bit of medications. In our clinical reasoning process, we need to think that about patients with renal disorders often have other medical conditions. And usually those medical conditions, pre-existing ones, are what have led them into renal disorders. Renal problems can and will impair homeostasis, and they can affect all organ systems. Kidney transplants or medications to prevent rejection of transplanted kidney injuries um, or to prevent rejection of the transplanted kidney may and will compromise the immune system because you don't want the body to fight against the transplanted kidney. Foley catheter increases suspension of infection. The treatment Anemia is a frequent complication of renal disease. We need to be cautious with rate of fluid administration. One, we do not want a hemodilutum so that, that they lose the oxygen carrying capacity of, of the red blood cells. We also don't want to fill them up with too much fluid and then they go into what we call flash pulmonary edema. We want to check breath sounds for indications of fluid overload frequently and again that's going to be your rails and crackles the popping sound of the fluid in the lungs. Also may be looking for um, excessive amount of coughing, excessive amount of productive coughing, pink, bloody, frothy sputum. Do not give additional fluids to renal patients who already have crackles in their lungs because all you're going to do is just back up that fluid into their lungs even more. And then reassess, we're going to reassess our, our baseline. And again, critical patients every 5 minutes, non-critical patients every 15. Why is anemia an important complication to identify? And we've talked about this in other lectures as well. Patients who are anemic have too little hemoglobin. The hemoglobin that is present may be fully saturated with oxygen. 
resulting in a high SpO2. However, the overall decrease in hemoglobin means that inadequate amounts of oxygen are carried and released to the tissues, resulting in hypoxia at the cellular level. We want to provide supplemental oxygen to increase the arterial uh, partial pressure.